So would you guys uh, give a man camp welcome to Ty Neal. Well, let me first start by saying my name is Ty. It is a joy to be with you. Uh, it is an absolute honor and privilege to be here. Uh, I, I'm here to serve you and help you. So if there's anything you need, please stop me and say, hey, would you pray for me or could you help me through this? And by the way, I know there's a lot of pastors in the room as well. Uh, would, can we just honor them real quick? If you're a pastor in the room, stand up. If you're a pastor of a church, would you stand up? Hey. Hey, stay, stay, stay standing. Hey. Hey, real quick, uh, a, a being a pastor is like the craziest thing in the world. Uh, I wouldn't wish that upon a lot of people. Uh, but here's the, one of the deals with the pastor. In their job description, like it says in 1 Timothy, it says that uh, basically that the enemy's job is to uh, set snares and set traps for them. And so I just want you men to make sure that you lift up your pastors and care for them well, love them well. They're people too. And, and pastors need friends and pastor needs help. So make sure you just honor and love them well, which I'm sure you're doing uh, in, that, in your context. But uh, I, my name is Ty again, and I'm married. I have a wife. Here's a picture of my family right here. Let me, let me explain all this because this will make sense. This is my wife, Angie. We've been married for 24 years now. Now, as you look at me and you hear me say, 24 years, Ty, how in the world did you make that happen? Well, I'm originally from Kentucky, and so I got married when I was 12. <laughs> it was an arranged marriage at a family reunion, so we, we got that locked down. That's, I, actually, I was 18, and so we're not related. That's one of the things you do in the South. You, like, when you get a girlfriend or you get a, you know, a person or whatever, you take them back to your family, like, hey, let's go down the family line real quick, make sure we're at least two removed, we're good to go. You know, we didn't want to have like six-toed kids and make the swim team. And so there we go. That's my wife, Angie. And then right next to her is Kenzie. She's my 23-year-old. She's married to right behind her, Richie. They got married in 2017. Richie came with a son, Levi, right there. So that's my six-year-old grandson. Beside my six-year-old grandson is my six-year-old daughter. So she's a powerful little thing, and she does not understand that she's Aunt Cora to Levi right there, so we don't want her to understand that power structure, because if that happens, that's not good for him. Right beside her, above Cora, is Tatum. Uh, Tatum is my 20-year-old, and that is her fiancé behind her. They're getting married this June, so that's two weddings in the past uh, couple of years. So I have a GoFundMe page if you guys want to help support that. That's great. And then that's Ian. He's my boy. He's there with me there. That is my family there. I love my family dearly. Like I said, I'm originally from Kentucky. I lived my first 30 years there. Um, I was not born and raised in a Christian home. I'm born and raised in a good home, but not a Christian home. Um, I met Jesus in my 20s. We'd already been married for about five years, and life was falling apart. We had two kids at that time, and then we just met Jesus, and Jesus radically saved us. I'm a third-generation Ford Motor Company factory employee. Uh, which meant uh, I put parts on trucks for a living. And then Jesus called me out of that and called me to move to Las Vegas. The guy who led me to Christ was planting this church in Las Vegas called Grace Point Church. Now, mind you, I grew up on a 70-acre tobacco farm, and we had one stoplight growing up. So what's the next transition in life? Well, obviously, Las Vegas from that. And so went there to plant the church uh, in 2007. Lo and behold, the guy who led me to Christ was not who he said he was. Uh, long story short, had a couple of affairs, had a ma massive blowout, uh, did not turn from that. End up, the guy who led me to Christ in my 20s, I end up having to church discipline. It's a crazy turn of events. And then we replanted the church, and then boom, we are Grace Point Church now. We just planted our first church from Grace Point Church. We call it Grace Point Church Northwest. There's the name right there. Uh, and it's just a, a great, great honor to be out there. Love Las Vegas, love that city. Uh, it's a city that needs a lot of love. City needs a lot of Jesus. I also, um, I miss being with lost people. Uh, one of the hardest things about being a pastor on staff is that you're around Christians all the time, which is a good thing, don't get me wrong, I like Christians, uh, but I really miss people who are not Christians because I really want to tell them about Jesus. And so uh, I was trying to figure out how, to, how can I connect to the city, how can I help out? Well, I decided if I, if I weren't a pastor, I wouldn't want to be a police officer. Any police officers in here? Any, any police force? Hey, thank you for what you do. That's, that's like, thank you, thank you. So I went through the chaplain program. I got a uniform. I got a badge. I got a wooden gun. It's a, I don't have a wooden gun, but that would be awesome. I have no authority whatsoever, but I get to be there with the police officers, the men and women there that serve and get to love and care for them well and get to tell them about Jesus. I just became a police uh, chaplain in the first um, thing I got called out to was one October. You know what that was, the big massacre in Las Vegas. And so that was my trial by fire. And so I had the uh, opportunity to go to the hospitals and be with people who had uh, been shot or the people, people close to them. So it was a, 
a trying situation. But anyway, enough about me. That is me. Um, I'll, I'll go through more as we go through uh, some of these messages. Where are we going this weekend? Well, I, I'm a simple guy, and I keep everything super simple. I, I basically came up with four questions. These are four questions that every man must answer and re-answer over and over in your life. You must keep coming back to these questions, and you must answer these questions over and over your lifetime. And answering these questions will help you not only make sense in this life, but will make sense of the life to come with us. Now, I know growing up in the country, anyone grew up in the south around here? And when I mean south, I mean like east of the Mississippi and uh, Mississippi River and then like the south. Okay, growing up in the south is weird. There's a lot of things that just don't make sense to you growing up in the south. Like, you know, you ever, I remember as a kid growing up and we had these new things called wa- uh, seedless watermelons. And I was always curious, that don't make any sense. How do you have a seedless watermelon? How do you get the second watermelon out of a seedless watermelon? Didn't make any sense to me. L- little things like that. I remember going to my grandma's house and my grandma looked at her cabinet, her medicine cabinet, and there was preparation H. I didn't understand what pre- preparation H was. So like, what is preparation H through G and what's getting us prepared for H? Didn't know. Things like that, just didn't understand. I remember growing up in the South and uh, everyone smokes in the South. I, mean, I grew up on a tobacco farm. My, my father just stopped raising tobacco a couple years ago. And um, as a kid, everyone smoked there. I mean, even the kids smoked. We, we just all smoked. And so I remember being in cars with family members, and I'm a little kid, and uh, it'd be really, really cold outside, and there was one smoking inside the car. And I would roll the window down, and like everybody would be like, oh my gosh, roll the window up. You're going to catch a cold. You're going to get pneumonia. I'm like, wait, okay, the secondhand smoke then. Let's do this. And there was just... Just growing up, a lot of things just didn't make sense. Well, for me, growing up, Jesus did not make sense to me at all. Um, again, like I said, not a church-going kid or church-going teenager or a young adult for that matter. And, and Jesus just didn't make sense. The only time Jesus and God were mentioned in my home is when, like, someone smacked their thumb with a hammer. I literally thought God's last name was damn. I didn't know. I mean, I didn't know any better. I was like, well, it must be his last name. I remember my grandmother, I would call her religious back in the day. She had a, a, a white Jesus picture hanging up in her house. And I mean, it was like, it was like 70s hair, feathered, rock band, like, Jesus. Um, I was like, okay, Jesus is white. And then I remember working in the city and, and, and had a lot of black friends there. And then they introduced me to black Jesus. I'm like, okay, my, you know, he's like the reverse Michael Jackson. Didn't know what was going on with him. I was like, is G- like which one is he? Um, I, I remember thinking Jesus was a bit weak. Like there just seemed like Jesus wasn't strong because little old ladies were the only person who liked Jesus. And so Jesus kind of seemed weak to me. I, w- I also thought, my dad helped me to believe this, that um, Jesus was a philanthropist and like he was always starting his business and he needed you to invest there. He needed your seed money. And if you invested in Jesus' business called the church, then it would pay great dividends to you as well. So I always thought, well, Jesus, he just wants my money. He doesn't want anything other than that. And so I really struggled. I really just could not make sense of who in the world is Jesus. So that brings us to this will be the first question that we're going to deal with in this series of questions. Now, I want you to think of this message today as kind of the baseline, the beginner's course, a little bit of Jesus 101. And you really can't pass go without getting Jesus and understanding Jesus. And so it's going to be very basic, very simplistic. But I think even when you do that, Jesus is very complex and Jesus is very deep. It's a good thing. I want you to think about this message as basically a four-part message. And so we'll keep coming back to these things as we answer the questions. But the first thing I want to do is I want to deal with the question, who is, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Now, I know in a room this size, there's probably four types of people that I'm going to be talking to. Four types of people. Now, some of you right now are like, don't you type me at all. Well, I'm typing you. I got a mic and this is what I'm doing. There's four types of people. The, the first type of person is someone who, who they know they're saved they, they know that Jesus has saved them, and, and they love Jesus. And you would be the first type of person. I, I'm just grateful for you. You get it. You have this great assurance. Like, you know that Jesus is, is, is your Lord and your Savior, and you know he loves you. Not a, an inch, not a, not a stitch of your work has helped Jesus save you or anything like that. Only thing you contributed was your sin, and Jesus has saved you. That's the first type of person. The second type of person is um, you are saved. Like, you would say, I'm saved. I'm a Christian. But you are restless restless with anxiety. Like there's this idea of like, you know what, I feel like I'm just one mistake away from God throwing down his hammer on me, God walking away from me, God being upset with me. You're just one, one more sin. Like if you, if you look at that porn one more time, Jesus is done with you. If you, if you lose your patience with your kids one more time, he's done with you. That, that you would be that second type of person. You believe that you're saved, but 
you're, you have a lot of anxiety, about, like a lot of spiritual anxiety of like, man, if I, if I mess up one more time, I think Jesus is going to be done with me. Some of you would be in that second category. Third category. I don't know how to say this any other way, but you know that you're not saved. You know that you're not a Christian. You know that you've not trusted Jesus. You've not given your life to Jesus. You don't trust him with the weight of your life and your existence and your return. You, you're not saved and you know it. And, and, and man, here's what I want to say to you. I am so thankful that you are here. I don't know why you're here. Maybe you're here to appease somebody. Maybe you like get someone off your back. Maybe this is a last ditch effort. Like marriage is imploding and blowing up and all that. And your wife is a Christian. You're like, all right, I'll, I'll at least try this to see if that'll do anything. Hey, I, I'm glad you're here, but I just want you to recognize that you would find yourself in that third category. The fourth category is a little bit more tricky. You are not saved, and yet you think you are. Like, you're, you're not. Like, you would say, well, you know, I, I, I grew up in a Christian home. I do religious stuff. I go to church. I give money. I do all these kind of things. But you're, you're, not, you're not saved. Hey, you remember that movie, uh, The Sixth Sense? Like, The Sixth Sense. It, it, like, what was Bruce Willis' greatest problem? Not that he was dead. He was dead and he didn't know he was dead. Oh, spoiler alert. Like, look, look, that movie's over a decade old. If you have not watched that movie by now, man, that's on you. But, but you, you, think, you think that you are, you are saved, but the reality is you are still, you're still dead in your sins. And here's what I would say to you. I, I'm glad you're here as well. I really want you to really lean, lean in on these messages. I really want you to lean in on these times of worship. I really want you to lean in and listen to what God is calling you to. He may, he may just be calling you to himself. And, and that's what we've been praying for. So uh, we're going to do some Jesus 101. Uh, and, and when it comes to Jesus, I just want to make sure today that we're on the same page. So if you've got a Bible, go to John chapter 1. We're just going to spend some time. I was trying to think, what is Jesus 101? John 1 really helps us with that. Um, make sure we're all on the same page. If we're not on the same page, good news for us. We have a book full of pages here called the Bible. And the Bible is all about Jesus. And so from this, we should get on the first page, on the same page. John chapter 1 is where we'll spend the bulk of our time today, tonight. Um, and, and let's play a little scenario because it's, uh, it's easy to talk about Jesus and, um, and not be talking about the same Jesus. So let's play an imaginary scenario. Let's, let's imagine. Imagine for a moment that you're in an elevator with other people, okay? And all of a sudden you hear clunk. And the elevator stops, the lights go off, and then the lights come back on, and you're in this elevator, and you're going to be in this elevator for a while. Someone tells you over the little speaker there, hey, this, you're going to be stuck, it's going to take a while. And so you're looking at these other people in there, and all of a sudden, someone, just out of the blue, throws out this question and says, hey, everybody, let's, let's have something to talk about. Who is Jesus? Could you imagine if that happened in real life? <laughs> like, oh, great. So let me tell you who's in this, this elevator with you. There's, it sounds like a joke. This sounds like a joke I'm getting to. Who's in the elevator with you? There's a Mormon, a Muslim, a Jehovah Witness, an enlightened millennial, and your next door neighbor who is unaffiliated with any religion. Okay? And then there's you. And so someone says, all right, who is Jesus? Well, the Mormon, he speaks up first. And he said, let me tell you who Jesus was. He was the firstborn son, firstborn child of Elohim. Uh, he was a product of a, the physical sexual relationship between Father God and the Virgin Mary. And for a time, God and Mary were actually husband and wife. And they had a sexual relationship as any married couple would. And they conceived Jesus. And the, the good news is if you work hard enough, well, then that Jesus can save you. Even in the book of, um, the book of Mormon, it says in 2 Nephi, it says this. For we know that it is by grace that we have been saved after all we do. It's in, it's in the Book of Mormon. It's in there. It's probably the first time the Book of Mormon has ever been quoted at man camp. <laughs> Check. For good right. So the Muslim hears this. No, 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 no. You've got it all wrong. Jesus is just like Abraham and Moses and Isaiah. He's a prophet of God, but he himself, Jesus, he is not God. Besides, Jesus, he really didn't die on the cross. He was rescued by God and carried to a safe place in heaven. So there was no death, no atonement for sin. Since there was no death, there's no resurrection whatsoever. So Jesus was just a prophet and nothing more than that. Well, all of a sudden, the Jehovah Witness like, no, man, I, I can't hear this any longer. You're both wrong. Prior to Jesus coming to earth, Jesus was Michael, the angel. He was the only created, the first product of Jehovah God's uh, his, his creative work. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He was stripped of his spiritual angelic nature and become holy and exclusively a man. And yet he worked really hard to become like a God. Now, this enlightened millennial had had enough. Like, like look, 
It's 2019. You guys are living like we're in the dark ages. Who believes in all this? Jesus. Maybe Jesus was alive and maybe he was a good teacher, but surely he was not God. Maybe he's someone that's taught us all to love one another and get along and peace and goodwill and all that kind of stuff. By the way, you probably believe in the, you know, the Easter bunny and the, you know, the tooth fairy or something like that. And then all of a sudden, here's your bewildered bystander of a neighbor sitting there like, oh gosh. Uh, shucks, I, I, don't, I thought Jesus was just a good guy. I thought he was just telling everybody to love everybody and that somehow he got killed. But if we just believe in God, a God of some sort, because all gods lead to, to, to heaven, if you just believe in something, well, then you'll be all right. And this is the moment everyone looks to you. And in this moment, you're begging God, God, please come back. You know, Jesus, return, or let this elevator. <laughs> and everybody, everybody wants to know... Everybody wants to know what, what you're going to say. Who, uh, who of all those people are right? Because they can't be all right, right? No one who's ever seen me said, yeah, yeah, I know Ty. He's tall, dark, and handsome. No one would ever say that. That's not the Ty I know. He's short, pasty, and looks like Jesse from Breaking Bad or whatever. Like, that's not, no way that's him. That's the wrong Ty. And when you hear all these different descriptions, someone told me I look like Jesse from Breaking Bad one time. Never tell people they look like people. Don't do that. No, it's like, that's not flattering. But... How could they all, they, they, can't, they can't all be Jesus because we've got, we've got a whole lot, of, whole lot of different things going on. So here's what we're going to do. Let's just let the Bible, Bible shape who Jesus is. Let's let the Bible show us who Jesus is. For many of us, you've been in church for a long time. If you're not careful, Jesus has become white noise to you. That like you just can't, you can't, can't hear you like I know Jesus lived perfect life Jesus died death on the cross Jesus came back three days later four uh, 40 days later he ascended I get it I get it no 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 don't let that become white noise that is good news the Bible calls that the best news so maybe tonight you would just hear this with some fresh ears you would be reminded of this good news that we would rehearse this good news together and that we would also respond to this good news John chapter one you guys ready to do some work okay four of you are ready I don't know about the rest of you let's do it in the beginning, so John's writing this. I'm not going to give you all the backstory. You guys can read that. In the beginning was the Word. Now, we notice that the Word is capitalized there, so we're talking about a person. In the beginning, and who are we talking about? Starts with a J, ends with the E. So that'll be the answer. Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So he's using this in the beginning. John's actually pointing back to the book of Genesis. Genesis simply means beginnings. He's doing this similarity between this. Now this beginnings is echoing the same thing that's said in Genesis here. In the beginning, but this beginning is a bit, bit different. In this text, the beginning is before creation. The fact is this, Jesus was has always existed. He was not created whatsoever. It says in the text here, and the Word, talking about Jesus, was with God. The Word was with God. Now, this gets a little bit confusing if we're not careful. We think, wait a minute, are there two gods? Is there the Word, which will be Jesus? We'll see in just a minute. And then there's, there's, there's God. Is there two different gods? No, no. What, what the, the writer here is talking about, there's this interpersonal relationship between God and the Word. That this always relationship, which is what we call the Trinity. There's a lot of Trinitarian language within the Bible. The word Trinity is not in the Bible, but we understand from the Bible that we can formulate there's Father, Son, Spirit, all equally God, uh, um, but one God, not three different gods. What was it? Um, was it Augustine or Augustine? Or it depends on where you're from. Uh, we'll say Augustine since we're on the West Coast. Augustine. He once said, uh, try, try to, if you deny the Trinity, uh, you'll lose your soul. Try to explain the Trinity, you'll lose your mind or something like that. So... <laughs> A little bit of Trinitarian language there, but John's connecting Jesus with creation, claiming that Jesus existed for creation. Jesus existed before the world began, before there was even time. Even in Genesis 1-1, you see there's no hint of any creation of God whatsoever. So just like here in John 1, there's no hint of creation of Jesus. This is what set Jesus apart from all the other so-called gods, the, the man-made God, the, the idols and, and figures and icons and even cult leaders that people have followed throughout the ages. By, uh, by the way, have you, you guys have learned the history about this place here. Man, you talk about a redemption story. This was like a big cultic place where people worshiped this weird dude and everyone wore red and it was just bizarre. And then God redeems things. Like, think about that. God redeemed this place for his glory like God redeems people for his glory. But anyway, another story. Verse three. It says, all things were made through him. All things. So which things? 
All, all things were made through him, and without him, not anything was made that was made. I like how John just said the same thing twice. Nothing was made without him. All things were made through him. So Jesus was not only present at creation, he's always, he, was, uh, he was there and active in creation. These all things that, that Jesus, the word, is the executor of the Father's plan, all the way back from the beginning to the cross and to the end. Jesus is the, executor, the executor of God, the Father's plan. Verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Later on, you see in John 10, 10, one of my favorite verses, it says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So do you want life? Do you want not just, not just eternal life, not just heaven, but do you want life now? Well, Jesus right here, life comes through Jesus. If you want life, true life, real life, what Jesus is giving, it must come through, through, through Jesus. Everything must come through Jesus. Verse 5, he says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So Jesus is the light in, in darkness. The world is dark without Jesus and hopeless. Light's an interesting thing. Light's either a good thing or a bad thing. Think about it. If, you're, if you decide to disobey the rules here and go on for a long walk out into the Oregon desert, which is a, probably a really bad idea, and imagine you get lost and you're in the middle of the dark and you've been gone you know, for like eight hours and you're hungry, you're already eating tree bark, it's a bad deal, and all of a sudden you see a light from the sky. Is that good light or bad light? It's not an alien, everybody. It's good light. It's it, that's called rescue. Like, yeah, so the light comes through the darkness, and we see, eh, all right, come on. I know it's late. Like, I should be in bed now, too, and you, too, as well, but it's okay. But, but light sometimes can be a bad thing. I remember uh, growing up, uh, again, grew up without Jesus, and so did a lot of things um, that people without Jesus do. And uh, I remember being a teenager, and we lived on a 70-acre farm. My parents still have this farm. And it's a big, long gravel driveway, not as long as this one, but it's pretty long. And I... I <laughs> I remember just being out and doing God knows what, and it was just not a good scene. And I remember driving in, and like, uh, I, I didn't pray because I didn't know how to pray, but I always think, oh God, oh God, oh God, I pray that I don't see the light on in the house. Because if the light on was in the house, that means the parents were waiting up for me, and that means, oh, there's going to be big time trouble. And so in that situation, light was actually a, a, a bad thing. I, light, light was, I was fearful of light, and that's what happens in the darkness. When, when the light comes to darkness, there's a fearful of fearfulness of the light. There's a, there's a fighting against the light that we don't, we don't want. We don't want the light. Even when Jesus came, when Jesus came and, and like the light was in the darkness, I mean, it really, people were not happy about it. There's this one scene in the gospel. If you've never read the gospels, the gospels are amazing. There's this one scene in the gospel where like there's this angry mob that form and they're like, you know, hey, we're going to grab rocks and we're going to throw them at Jesus until he dies. They're going to stone him to death, which I know we're in Oregon. And then like same thing with Nevada. We got to understand what stone means. Just means throwing rocks is what we're talking about there. And it says basically, that's what it means. It says basically, Jesus just walks through the crowd and not a rock one touches him. It's bizarre. But I mean, later on, they did get a hold of him and they eventually they nailed him to the cross. And, and, and um, I read this quote recently by H.H. H. Farmer. It says, when you go against the grain of the universe, you get splinters. But when the light comes to darkness, he got splinters. And the splinters that Jesus got on our behalf was, was the cross. Because... That's light. They, they, they killed Jesus. They shoved him in a tomb. He was dead for a couple of days, three days. And then what? He came back to life. That's what we just celebrated Sunday, right? And, and so even death could not overcome it. It says right here back in verse 5, it, said, it says even the darkness has not overcome it. That, that Jesus defeated the, the darkness. That Jesus came back to life defeating sin, Satan, and death. Whatever it is that men that we, that, that seems like it's constantly overcoming us, oh, Jesus can defeat that. Jesus can overcome the grave. Jesus can do that. Look at verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness. So John is a witness. This is John the Baptist. To bear witness about the light that he might believe through him, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. So John is a witness. So unless your name is Jesus, which is, not, well, it might be, but anyway, it should, but unless you're the savior of the world, and there's only one Jesus, then we are all like John. We are, we are just the witness. You are not the hero of the story. The hero of this, of this whole word of the Bible is, is Jesus. And so John gets that from Jump Street, that John is just a voice in the wilderness later on in the gospel. It says, right, a voice to the word is who he is. 
And so we are not the hero of the story. So that takes a lot of pressure off of us. We're not saving anyone. We're not sustaining anyone. We're not the hero of anyone's story whatsoever. Jesus is the only hero. All we are is witness. We are the one pointing. There was a guy by the name of Karl Barth, the 20th century Swiss theologian. He, had this, he wrote this book called Church Dogmatics. And he had this painting above his de- desk called The Crucifixion. Check it out. And it's Jesus on the cross. But you know this, the, the character on the right-hand side with the, the oddly pointed finger? That is, a, that is a, a picture of, of John the Baptist. And they would ask people, why do you have this? He said, this is my favorite painting. He said, all of my life is to be John the Baptist's pointy finger right there. He said, this is what we are called to. We are to be the pointing finger of Jesus in all of our life. He is the one. We get to verse 9. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Basically saying that, that he was in the world, but the world did not know him, that, that they didn't all receive them. That means non-Jesus people. Non-Jesus people did not want to see Jesus. There was people that did not want anything to do with Jesus, didn't see him as Jesus, didn't want him as Jesus. Non-Jesus people didn't want Jesus because they loved their, their sin more. They loved their, their darkness more. And no matter what you do, it's like they had scales over their eyes or they have their ears plugged into where they cannot hear about this Jesus. They cannot see this Jesus. They cannot have the heart to understand this Jesus. And we can tell them about Jesus over and over. And at the time, people heard about Jesus, but they couldn't see Jesus. Well, why is that? It's like looking at the sun and telling someone to look at the sun. There, can't you see the sun? It's like they're looking at the sun. I can't see the sun. Why is that? Well, Romans, Romans 1 tells us. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, has been clearly perceived. I think it's interesting that Paul writes there, invisible is clearly seen. This is interesting. Clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were. What's that word right there? Is it on the screen? Verse 21. Go to the next. Is it not on there? Okay, that's my bad. The word is darkened. <laughs> Their hearts were darkened. Dark. Claiming to become wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. They can't see because their hearts are so darkened. The only the light of Christ can penetrate that. Verse 11. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. So the Jewish people have all of the Old Testament. If you, like, if you don't know anything about the Old Testament, let me give you one clue about the Old Testament. All of the Old Testament is pointing to Jesus as the Messiah. Like from, John, or from Genesis 1-1, especially when you get to Genesis 3-15, talking about this snakehead crusher, which if you're a wrestler or wrestler, that'd be a great name, snakehead crusher. Like all that is pointed to Jesus. All the prophets, all the minor prophets, the major prophets, all, everyone is pointing to this one who will come, who will eventually defeat Satan completely and crush the head of the snake. And said, even these people who were waiting for Jesus, waiting for him, said, nah, they, they didn't recognize him. Well, why is that? They, they rejected Jesus because they wanted their glory more than Jesus having their glory. Jesus didn't come as they thought. He would come this conquering king that would overthrow Roman rule and be, set up shop for Israel and all that. He, he, he came unassuming. Verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Who were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, I'm going to start slowing down a little bit. I'm starting to get a little Jesus 101. Let's, let's, let's tease this out. He says in this text right here, receive him. Receive him just means believe. And when you believe upon Christ, believe unto Christ, you can become a, children, a child of God. Now, I'm going to say something that's wildly um, not popular, but it's, but it's biblical. It's a truth that's not always accepted. Humans, by nature, by default, are not children of God. You can watch television and read newspaper and like, we're all children, God's children. That's not true. That right there tells us something different. We are his creation. We're the crown jewel of his creation, I will say. We are all, everyone is created in the image of God, deserve dignity and, and, and worth and value and respect. Absolutely. But you're not a child of God unless you have trusted Jesus Christ. Unless he has paid for your sin penalty, unless the Father has adopted you by the blood of Jesus, you are not a child of God. You're his creation and what he loves. 
but you're not his son. You must be, you must be adopted. Uh, I, I, for a long time there, several years ago, I worked for a funeral home. So I was, I was pastoring a church. And um, I, actually, it was before I was lead pastoring a church. I started working for a funeral home because I wanted, again, to connect with the city and any way to serve the city and do different things like that. And so I've done a lot of funerals in my day, which is kind of difficult sometimes because you kind of step into people's lives at their most difficult pain moments, and you don't really know them, but like, I want to come and be a gospel presence there. And I can't tell you how many people talked about their, their loved one being this child of God and God wanted his child back, and there was like no evidence of their faith in Christ whatsoever. Matter of fact, some people were just like anti God and anti-Jesus, but they were like, you know, sending them off to heaven. That some people would say that uh, they got their wings and now they're angels. By the way, just so you know, you don't become an angel. You don't want to become an angel when you die. That's not, that's not a good deal. Uh, but, but the idea is this. The prerequisite for heaven was just death. That's what most people think the prerequisite for heaven is. Just die, be halfway decent human being, and then God will accept you into his kingdom and like you're a son or his daughter. And right here, it's not biblical. It says that you must receive Jesus. Some of you in that third category I talked about that you know that you're not saved. Here, I want you to know that you can receive Jesus. You can, you can trust Jesus. Jesus wants you. His grace is for you. He is for you and he wants you. And so you can receive Jesus. And when you receive Jesus, listen, you're adopted as, as a son. You become a child of God. And whoever is in the Father's hand, no one can snatch you out of his hand. That's the good news of adoption when it comes to God. But you must receive Jesus. Look what it says, verse 12 again. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right. See, you can't take that just by saying, well, like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a human and I exist, and so that means I'm a child of God. No, he has to give you sonship. He has to give you this adoption. He gave the right to become children of God who are born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So we get this far and we have to summarize. We look this far and we say, okay, Jesus, Jesus is God. We, we can agree upon that. We can look at John chapter, I mean, you can look throughout the Bible. It just very clearly says that Jesus, Jesus is God is God. And we hear that, and if you're a part of a Christian church, you're part of good Bible preaching, which I'm just assuming you are, because I know a lot of these brothers in here, then you're like, yes, I know that Jesus is God. But what else? That, that brings a lot of questions. If Jesus is just God, well, what does it mean about him coming to earth? Was he also man? Was God just wearing a mask? Like, like was it just like a skin mask he was wearing and like, you know, living for us? What difference does it make? Was Jesus, I heard one, one say it like this, was Jesus basically Superman? You know, when you look at Superman, if you haven't noticed, when you look at Superman, he's just Clark Kent minus the glasses. Worst disguise ever. And like when you watch, I used to watch the old Superman as a kid and you watch, you know, Superman, he's getting shot at. And, or you watch Clark Kent, you know, there's buildings falling on him and there's car crashes, he's getting shot at. And you're like, oh no, Clark Kent, he's in trouble. But then you realize, oh, wait a minute, it doesn't matter. He's Superman. He's going to be okay. He does, he's not feeling any of that. He's, he's kind of faking it. So when we look at Jesus, do we think, well, wait a minute, was Jesus the same way? Like he goes to the cross, like, ooh, ooh, out, out. Like he just kind of fakes it. Like he's, he's God. He really, he really didn't feel all that. Well, if that's true, then it then, then it's all kind of feels like a farce. It feels like a lie. Look at, look at verse 14. I think there's a good explanation there. It says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And it's got parentheses. John bore witness about Him and cried out, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because He was before me. He uses this word, verse 14, dwelt. And he's pointing back to the Old Testament tabernacle. Remember the Old Testament tabernacle? You know, if you will, it's kind of the mobile home of God during the Old Testament. And so uh, it, that was the, uh, it kind of was. I mean, it was without wheels. They'd set it up, tear it down. No shame in that game. I had a trailer growing up. Uh, that's cool. But that was the center of worship. And so that's where all the people of God would go to worship. And so what John is saying here is profound that he's saying that Jesus is the center of our worship, that he dwelt, he tabernacled. That means he's here, he's the center of our worship. Now, what else does that mean? Well, it's the word we get from incarnation. You know, you've probably heard of the word carne, carne asada. Anybody know what carne asada means? It's like tasty Mexican meat, right? And so 
that means that Jesus took on, he took on meat. He took on Jesus in the flesh. Grace has a face, and it's Jesus. So he, he came and he took on flesh. You know, the Bible talks a lot, about, uh, a lot about us becoming like Jesus, but the primary focus is that Jesus became one of us. That's one of the, the good news of the gospel. So who is Jesus? Well, he, he's also a man. Jesus was fully God and fully man. And to try to figure out those two things together is fully confusing at times. But he was fully man. I mean, think about it. Jesus had to live life like we did. Sometimes, you know, he'd get tired or he'd get hangry. I mean, he had to deal with like the teenage years. Those years are really tough. Had to deal with his parents. His parents lost him one time. That's never good. I mean, like, he had all, all this going on. But Jesus becomes fully man. And see, Jesus didn't come to rescue us from our humanity, but to rescue us from our sinfulness because he's the one that became human. C.S. Lewis is one of my um, favorite authors, and he talks about Jesus becoming a man. He says this, Lying at your feet is your dog. Imagine for a moment that your dog and every dog is in deep distress. Some of us love dogs very much. If it would help all the dogs in the world become like men, would you be willing to become a dog? Would you put down your human nature, leave your loved ones, your jobs, hobbies, your art and literature and music, and choose instead of the intimate communion with your beloved, the poor substitute of looking into your beloved's face and wagging your tail, unable to smile or speak? Christ, by becoming man, limited the things which to him was the most precious thing in the world, his unhampered, unhindered communion with the Father. This is really good news. Jesus is God. Jesus is man. So at this point, you you got to be you, you got to be here. You got to be sitting here thinking, okay, Ty, I get it. Jesus is God. Jesus is man. We learned this way back in Sunday school on the flannel graph, you know, boards and all that. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible told me. Like we get this. So what what is the what is the point of this? I think there, when it comes to Jesus being God, we talk a lot about that. When Jesus becoming man, we don't talk a lot about that. I think there's a huge point. If we're not careful, we miss. Hebrews talks about this. Hebrews 4.14. I want you to see this. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. So he says, we can hold fast to our confession. Our confession if you're a Christian in here, our confession that we love Jesus, that Jesus lived perfectly for us, that Jesus died on the cross in our place for us, that Jesus came back to life, defeating sin, Satan, death. Forty days later, he ascended to the right hand of the Father, awaiting his return. This good news called the gospel, that we can hold fast to that confession. We can hold fast to it. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect. Now, what does every respect mean? You want to guess? Somebody throw that out there. Yes, every respect, you got it. Who in every respect has been tempted as we are. Think about your greatest temptations. In every respect has been tempted. Whatever that is, what is your, like, it's popping in your mind right now. Your greatest temptation. Yet without sin. Marvel at Jesus. Not once did he sin. Listen, think about that for yourself. Are, are you broke? Like, Jesus was broke. Jesus really didn't have nothing. He didn't have a place to lay his head half the time. He had to go stay at people's houses. Heck, he was born in a barn. That's, no, that's not good. Like, so Jesus can sympathize what it's like to have absolutely nothing. Men, do you struggle when it comes to temptation with women? Do you struggle with that? Jesus was around a lot of women. But matter of fact, there's one story in the gospel. Here's what I think. There's a little bit of holy imagination. You have to watch out for the imagination on this, but a little bit of holy imagination. Remember that scene where they caught the woman in, in adultery? If you read into the gospel, it says they caught her in the act and they drug her out to the middle of the street. Now, the, the gospel doesn't say anything about, well, they put some clothes on her first and did all. No, 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 no. Like all these men were standing around, got rocks to throw at her and all this. So Jesus, potentially, there's a woman, uh, maybe not a lot of clothes or whatever. And yet she's there and, and, and he's tempted in every way that we are and yet had no sin whatsoever. Marvel, like just marvel at Jesus. Have you ever been betrayed by a close friend? You ever been betrayed by someone who loves you and you loved? Have you ever been betrayed by? Jesus was betrayed by just about everybody. I mean, even one boy sold him out for 30 pieces of silver. 
like to where it's like hand him over to be crucified. He, he died. So Jesus can sympathize with you. Some of you, maybe you're single men in here. And you're like, man, I'm single and like, there, you know, is there something wrong with me or whatever? Look, Jesus can sympathize with that as well. I don't know if you know this or not. Jesus was, was single. He, he did okay. Like he died a virgin. You're going to be okay. I promise. You'll be all right. But see, Jesus... <laughs> I, I mean, th- like, I'm just putting one plus one together. The Bible doesn't say that, but that's my assumption. <laughs> See, whatever you're going you, you, through, you probably think, well, no one understands. That is a lie from the pit of hell. There is one who understands. His name is Jesus. He understands, and yet he's doing the thing as a Christian we're trying not to do. We're trying not to succumb to temptation. We're, 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 honestly, we don't want to sin if we got really, we don't want to. And yet he did what we're trying to do. He, did, ha, he had no sin whatsoever of the mind, of the heart, of the eyes, of the hand, of his mouth, of his body. Like no sin, like marvel, marvel at Jesus. See, some of us, we're not careful just because of temptation, just because we feel like no one is no one understands us. The, the, this confession that we hold, it feels like at times it just slips out of our hand. Why? Life's hard. Life's painful. We hurt, we're wounded, there's weaknesses. Family, friends, church people sometimes betray other church people. It happens. We feel like God doesn't, God doesn't answer our prayers sometimes. Like there's just, life, life is hard. We think, how, how can I not just let this confession slip away? How can, how can I hold tight? Well, just be reminded of this verse. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. He can sympathize with our, our weaknesses. We're going to talk about that a lot down the road. But I mean, do, do you feel weak today? I know this is so hard for us as men. Because like, man, I'm in a room with men and we're supposed to be eating beef jerky and stuff. Like, But, I mean, are you weak, burned out, busted, tired, frustrated? Listen, Jesus can sympathize. Jesus was hungry. Jesus was tired, it says. He wept. He suffered. He experienced loss. Like, he lost his, remember, remember Lazarus? That was his buddy. Like, the Bible says Jesus wept. That's not just shedding a tear. That's a shoulder shrug and cry ugly situation going on there. Like he, he wept. He buried people he loved. See, in, in, a mom, in, in our moments of weakness, we sometimes feel like, you know, we should run from God. We should run from Jesus because we're too weak and Jesus wants us strong. That's a lie. See, that's the moment we run to someone who can sympathize with us. Jesus, he, God became flesh, became man. Let me keep going with this. Verse 14, back in John. They told me I had an hour and a half to preach. I was like, that's remarkable. They didn't. I didn't start my timer. Verse 14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory is the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so Jesus comes with this truth. Truth's a hard pill to swallow sometimes. David Foster Wallace said this one time. The truth will set you free, but not until it's done with you. That's the truth of Jesus. It will not set you free. It'll set you free, but not until it's done with you. And so, but Truth is painful at times for us to hear. The truth of our sin, the truth of our brokenness, the truth of our our weakness. See, the truth addresses not only the symptoms of our brokenness, but also the source of our brokenness. And it goes right into the pain like like a salve, like an ointment, like a a cleansing agent. So we we may have healing. We may find peace from that. But we, um, we, don't, we don't like truth. We'll, we'll do whatever it takes if we're not careful to run from truth. Many of you here probably have done that in your life to where, like, you're going through seasons of life and you kind of walk away from God's word, you know, the quiet time or whatever goes down a bit. Walk away from community or accountability. Walk away from church a bit because that's where truth is found. And we think, you know, I don't need, I don't need that kind of truth right now. kind of got my own truth. But here's the reality. We are the greatest liars to ourselves. No one lies to you more than you. And what we need balancing that, what we need surpassing that is the truth of God. Here, here's how I know that no one lies to you more than you. Uh, it's been a couple years ago. I had one of those tasty, um, ever had those little Starbucks drinks, those little Frappuccinos in the bottle? You ever seen those things? They're delicious. I, used to, I drank them before. And um, I, I saw the front of it and it said only 140 calories. I was like, remarkable. I'm going to drink this. And so I popped the top, took a drink. I was like, there's no way. This is, this is not happening. This is a lie. I turned it over and looked at the back of the label. And it said uh, 140 calories, 2.5 servings. I was like, 
there's no way I'm going to share this with 1.5 other human beings. And so, I, you know, I just, I just drank that lie down, like, 140 calories, here we come. Like, just drank it all, because you're not saving that stuff. Well, that's the deal. We, 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 we lie to ourselves. I'll be okay. I don't need other men in my life. I don't need to express my weakness. I don't need to tell people what's going on in my life. Listen, whatever's going on in your life begins to lose power when you start to talk to other men about it. When you allow the truth of God's word to expose it and the truth of a brother to come around and love you well in a very, because it says truth and grace, in a very gracious and loving way. We, we need God's truth, and, and God's truth has come to us in Jesus. Verse 16, let's get, let's, let's get down this hill. Here we go. For from his fullness we all receive grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, talking about the Old Testament. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him, him known. So we, when we see Jesus, we see God. That's what he's saying there. Now, why is this important? Why Jesus? You ever think about that sometimes? Why Jesus? And doesn't that sound anti-intellectual? Or doesn't that sound a little snobby, like, like Jesus is the only way to heaven? That's Jesus' words, not mine. Jesus said he's the only way, and I'm just glad there is a way. But, but, but why, why Jesus? I mean, some people, and you may think this as well, isn't, isn't religion, isn't like a religion a choice thing? Like earlier I said Muslim, and I said Mormonism, Jehovah Witness, Enlightened Millennial, whatever. Can I just, isn't like I can be a 49ers fan or a Seattle Seahawks fan or or whatever, can I just pick and choose? Like, wh wh why Jesus? Why all this? Well, let me help you with this. Imagine the first Adam. You remember the first Adam from the garden? God gave him one deal, like, hey, don't eat of the tree. Like, just, you had one job, bro. Don't eat of the tree. And what did he do? He ate of the tree. And so we had sin entered humanity, like an infection. Sin entered the world. And so Adam failed. But what if, what if God did something different? What if in that moment, God created a second Adam and said, hey, don't do that. And God helped him to live an entirely sinless life. And somehow, the second Adam, he skipped past this uh, imputed sinfulness, this sinfulness, it's uh, sin nature that's passed down from our parents to parents to parents all the way down. Could this second Adam, gone to the cross, suffered for our sins, paid the debt as a substitute, and can we have peace if we trusted that? If there was a second Adam that was born fully man, would that have been enough? What do you think? Yes or no? You don't, you're like, I don't, I don't know, I don't know what to say. <laughs> just go, hey, just be loud and wrong. It's okay. Yes or no? With the second Adam dying for our sins, and he never once sinned, he's just man, would that be enough to pay for our sins? Okay. Consensus, a no on that one, okay? Well, no. You're right. Good job. <laughs> it doesn't pay our debt fully. It's not enough. It's not the right sacrifice. See, back in the Old Testament, before Jesus came, before John 1, uh, in, in order to have your sins forgiven, you had to do what? You have, to, you have to kill animals. And if you know any, anything about the rate of killing animals, man, they were slaying some animals back in the day. Man, you hate to be a, an animal back in that day. And so, um, and the reason why is only the shedding of blood can we have forgiveness of sin. Uh, and so they, they, they slaughtered these animals over and over and over. And it's a picture of this one sacrifice that would come. And so I was reading this book not too long ago by a guy by the name of Dr. Bruce Ware. And he gives this illustration of what's going on in the Old Testament. And this makes sense, so check this out. He says, suppose you're in the mall and uh, you find a pair of shoes you like. Any, sho any sneaker heads in here? Anybody? No, cool. All right, so suppose you find whatever camping equipment or whatever you're into, you see that in the mall. And I'm just guessing from Oregon, everybody's got a rooftop tent out here. It's awesome. It's cool, I like it. And so suppose you're at REI and you find it there. I'm not pandering. And you find it there. <laughs> And you're like, man, I really want that. And so you go up, uh, you go and you take your, your tent to the register and, and you put down a credit card and they let you walk out of there. Now, why is that not called shoplifting? Like you, you didn't lay any money down. You didn't you know, push your pennies across or anything like that. Why is this, why, why are they not stopping you at the door? Well, you're free to leave because you've entered a legal contract with your credit card company and them. You have this plastic thing called a credit card and you enter this transaction when you swipe or chip or whatever that says, hey, they're paying it on your behalf. You're going to pay the credit card company back. So even though you've not paid a penny for them, you've tied yourself in this legal agreement to where you will pay the shoes off in the future. And by the way, you should pay your credit card off. That's a side note. That's free. So while the shoes are legally yours, they're really only paid for when you pay the credit card statement off. 
In a similar way, Bruce Ware says this, God forgave the sins of all Old Testament saints as it were on credit. So God devised a system of sacrifices by which each of those animal sacrifices would signal his obligation at some point in the future to ensure that the payment would be fully made for the sins of the people of the Old Testament. In order to forgive the people of the Old Testament, at that point in history, he had to put in place this plan in which their sins, pronounced forgiven by him, then would one day actually be fully paid for in full. So apart from the future payment, those animal sacrifices of the Old Testament are pointless. Do you, are you following with me? Tracking with me? Okay, it's pointless. So the question is, how do we as humans pay for our sins? How, how do we pay for it for ourselves? Well, if we were to pay for our own sins, we would pay for our own sins eternally, forever. We, it's like being getting slaughtered over and over for the rest of forever. Forever. I mean, forever. That's why if you have not received Jesus, if you have not trusted Jesus, you will pay for your sins for the rest of eternity. That is what the Bible calls hell. The Bible speaks very clear. The reason that hell is eternal is simply that justice demands a full payment for for sin. A full payment is impossible for finite human beings to render to an infinitely holy God. So therefore, if we pay our sins, we pay forever. So the hypothetical second Adam, if he were to go before us and he lived perfectly and died on a cross and all that, he still could not pay for our sins. He can't, do, he's only a human. He's not God. He, his blood is not of infinite worth. And so there's only one, there's only one that can make us right with God. There's only one who can pay the price for our adoption. There's only one who can pay for the penalty of our sin. There's only one who can grant us the forgiveness of sin. There's only one, his name is Jesus. Listen, listen. here's Jesus 101. Jesus is fully God. And Jesus is fully man. In light of all that, is this the Jesus you worship? Is this the Jesus you trust? Not only with heaven. We talk about heaven a lot. Can't wait to get there. It's going to be amazing. But we got biz right now. Like, is this the, is this the Jesus you trust now, the Jesus you love, worship, and adore? Or, or friends, by, have, 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 you, have you kind of been off, off, the, off the wrong page with Jesus? Have you seen Jesus as just this religious guy? You've seen Jesus as kind of like this icon for Sunday. Jesus as the church mascot, bring him out, rah, 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 put him back up, let's live some life. Or is, G is Jesus truly God to you? Is Jesus truly fully man who, who is your high priest that can sympathize and yet was tempted in every way with, with no sin? Who is Jesus? Listen, here's the answer to that. He is the only God-man who can save us. That's why all of our songs are about Jesus. That's why this whole book is about Jesus. That's why our lives are, are focused upon Jesus. It's not just because Jesus is a Sunday guy. It's that Jesus is the fully man, fully God guy who came and lived perfectly and died sacrificially and rose victoriously and ascended and who rules and reigns and will one day come back and he will right all wrongs. He will wipe away, wipe away tears. And everyone will bow at knee to this Jesus. Is this the Jesus you bow at knee to? Earlier I asked you, which one are you? Four types. Some of you said, I'm, a, I'm saved. I know I'm saved. I love Jesus. I, I am so grateful for your faithfulness. Christianity is so grateful for your faithfulness. Your churches are grateful for your faithfulness. Just keep loving Jesus. I read this quote one time, and I wanted to help. I just wanted to share this with you. It says, the mature Christian is easily edified by chip stamp is that you're easily edified. But listen to me. Some of you have been following Jesus for a long time. You say, I know I, know I love Jesus, and Jesus loves me. I know I'm saved. Listen to me. Don't let this just be another weekend. Just because, like, well, you know, I'm not getting saved. I'm already saved. I'm just kind of here. I'm here to help out brothers. Maybe God is calling you to something this week. Maybe God is calling you, calling you to be a pastor, to be a planter, to be a leader. Maybe God is calling you to move from the city you're in and move to another city and, and help support a church. Maybe God is calling you to move across the sea. Don't just, don't just close your door because like, hey, I did business with Jesus and I had my quiet time with Jesus. I'm good with Jesus. No, no, no. Jesus may be calling you to more. Some, some of you are in that second place of like, you, you believe you're saved, but you're just, you're, just one, you're just one sin away. 
You're just one screw up away from God just being finished with you or whatever that is. Hey, can, can I just ask you this? Will you, will you be very attentive during these next three messages? Because I'm going to talk a lot about God's grace. I'm going to talk about a lot about that and his finished work and what that really means in your life. Would you just, just be really attentive, really attentive to like, that, that his grace can be scandalous and be really that good, that, that um, it's bigger than your sin. It's bigger than your screw-ups and your mistakes. Some of you are in that third place. You say, you know what, Todd, I, I don't trust Jesus. Listen to me. Here, here's the reality, and I want to say this as clear as I can. Without Jesus, you're doomed. All right, good night. <laughs> Without Jesus, you, you're, you're doomed. You can't pay for your sin. You, you can't find forgiveness by your good works. Your good will not outweigh your bad. Because you're not 100% perfect, and that's God's standard. We blew that, am I right? So what, what would prohibit you from trusting Jesus tonight? What, what obstacle is in your way? I don't know enough. I'm not sure about it. Maybe there's other options. Jesus is the one. Thank God we have a way to salvation. And, and so I'm calling you tonight. Why not trust Jesus? You've got pastors with you. You've got friends with you. you hey, if you're a Christian, this is your time tonight. Say, hey, dude, I know you don't trust Jesus. Let's talk about that. Like, you don't need a pastor for that. Like, you, you know Jesus. Just, like, be the finger of John. Just point to Jesus. What would prohibit you from trusting Jesus? I pray that the hound of heaven would hunt you down. For, for some of you in that fourth category, you would say, I, I'm saved, but like, it's just religion. It's just churchianity. It's not Christianity. It's just something, it's something else. I'm going to ask you to pay, pay attention this weekend. Though I don't want to question your salvation, but I want you to leave here with just assurance. Assurance of like, I know, I know Jesus loves me. I know I love Jesus. I know I have union with Christ. That's what I want for you. So this is for the first part. We're going to keep going. These are going to build upon one another. I, here's what I want to simply do. I just want to pray for you. So if you would, just join me in prayer. Father, you are, you are good and you are gracious and kind. You are merciful. It says your kindness leads us to repentance. Your mercy knows no bounds. It's new every day. That you are rich in mercy. And because of your grace, you take dead things and make them, make them come to life. Like this place here and like many of these men here. And so God, we worship you. We love you. We are grateful for you. Father, I pray for those who know they're saved. I pray, God, that you would just, you would allow them to be so quieted during the next couple of days. You would allow their hearts to be rested and them to be listening to you. And I pray, Holy Spirit, you would just whisper to them. Call them out. Father, I pray for the weary Christian who just feels like they're one sin away from you walking away. May they be reminded of the prodigal son to where you just ran after them, Father. May, may they this weekend see the smile of your face all because of what Christ has done on their behalf. May, 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 they, may they just realize and live within that no one can snatch them out of the Father's hand. Father, I pray for those who do not know Jesus, who have not trusted and followed Jesus. I can sit up here and talk all night long, but your word is powerful. The gospel is the power of, of you. And so, God, all we can ask is just save them. Just, just save them. Take them from death to life, please, for your glory and for our good. And, Father, I pray for those who have been deceived, potentially, that believe they, they have a relationship with you, but all they have is religion. Break that stronghold as well this week. Pray that they, you would show them you and that you would give them you. I pray that they would, you would just save them as well. And God, may this be for our good. May this be for our joy. May it be for the good of our communities and our homes. And Jesus, may it be for your glory alone, we pray. Amen.